Okay? If our body's able to handle that more slowly over time, and that's what fiber does, it kind of slows down that process, then we don't have such a big insulin spike. We have just a little, you know, and that's really the goal. That's the goal when it comes to blood sugar and insulin, um, especially for those of us who aren't diabetic, but it's still important. Um, is that we keep that insulin kind of on just like this little, you know, little blip, blip, you know, through our day as opposed to these whoosh, because when it goes up, it crashes down. And then we're usually low in energy, we start craving, so when we're craving a lot of carbohydrates, if we feel hypoglycemic, that's because we've had a big spike that then we've dropped too low. And too low, not like you need to run, you know, if we're not diabetic, that doesn't mean we need to run and you know, consume a bunch of sugar to bring it back up. Um, it just means we need to figure out not how not to have these big spikes. So the fiber slows that down. What is insulin resistance? So insulin resistance is where either because genetically yeah. or because um, your body, either genetically you do not, your body kind of overreacts when it comes to insulin. So for example, I am insulin resistant genetically, okay? Trevor is not, okay? Trevor eats a piece of bread and his blood sugar and insulin go like this. I eat the same piece of bread and my blood sugar and insulin do this, okay? Because my body's overreacting to that blood sugar spike. That can happen, like I said, genetically, or it can happen because we've worn our pancreas out over time and where, where insulin is produced and so we're, we're making, our body can't quite figure out how much insulin it's supposed to make because we've kind of worn it out. Um, in either of those things, either of those situations though, there are a lot of things that you can do to improve what's called your insulin sensitivity. So we want, our, we want to be sensitive to insulin. We want our insulin to do just exactly what it needs to do and not overreact, okay? So insulin resistance is not something that you just, well, it is what it is. Um, there are definitely things that you can do, strategies to improve your insulin resistance. That's gonna be different, though, if it's genetic versus it's been acquired over time. Um, and that's something that um, the fitness and nutrition genetic testing that we do can help show you. Like, okay, well, if you feel like you're insulin resistant now, is that because that's what your genes say, and there's certain things we can do to work on that. Or if you feel like you are insulin resistant, then, um, which to be very honest, by the time we're probably in our, you know, by the time we're in, in midlife, when we're 50s, we're 60s, where most of us are probably moved quite a bit towards insulin resistance, just because of the amount of work our pancreas has to do to process all of this. Mm -hmm. Especially when maybe earlier in our lives we weren't really um, aware of how much of that we were putting in. When we were eating all the snack oil cookies because they were fat free. <laughs> um, th that, didn't, that didn't do our, our blood sugar and insulin any good. Um, so, so the serving size is important uh, because if we have one of these, our blood sugar and insulin is going to go up just a little bit, but if we have two or three of those, then our insulin and blood sugar is going to go up quite a bit more, okay? Fat, this is about a serving. Now, fat's hard to tell because it's about one <laughs> tablespoon or so is about a serving of fat, but sometimes that's hard to see. For example, in these almonds, that's a serving, that's how many, that's how much is in there, that's a serving of almonds, right? So about, that's gonna kind of over, overflow a, a tablespoon. Right? But, I don't know about you, but like when I go grab a handful of nuts from my pantry, I'm having several of those servings. I'm not likely just having one serving. That's why I really love things that I don't, things that are hard for me to control the serving size, I love these individualized packets. The same thing with the crackers, like I can go through a whole, um, you know, a whole, you know, just handful after handful of crackers. So the prepackaged ones, um, because I don't do good with portion control, and I don't do good with the self-control in just having the one portion, um, and that's just me. Some people, some people can go eat the cookie, and they're very happy that they ate that one cookie, but that's not me. 
I'll have the second cookie and the third cookie. And if I start with the cookies, I'm not stopping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So um, the little, the same thing with the same thing with nut butter. Um, you have about one tablespoon to two tablespoons of nut butter is going to be about a serving. Okay. You can kind of think of usually if you put your thumbs together, that's about if you're eyeballing it, that's about how much a serving of most fats are. Same thing with like butters and stuff like that. So um, some people are surprised. Like you, I mean, butter, you get a good, pretty good serving of butter. It's not, yeah, not bad. It's not something. Um, the other the other thing that gets tricky is like these grapes. So that's my handful serving of grapes, right? right? When I take all the water out of those grapes, this is how much raisins I end up with for a serving. Can you eat more raisins than that, Elena? Oh, really? <laughs> and then when you cook those those grapes down to jelly, that's how much jelly you're left with. So even though jelly is a carbohydrate, that's not your serving <laughs> of jelly. You have, you have to um, you know, pay attention to what form it's in. The one other place that really surprises people is the banana. Do you notice something about this banana? It's only half of one. Because the, the average size banana to fit in the palm of your hand is only going to be about a half. Again, it's not a matter of don't ever eat the whole banana. It's just knowing I'm I'm having two serving I'm having two servings of carbohydrates. How many servings of carbohydrates per meal should you have? Okay, so I usually like to look at a day. Okay, so in a day, and we're going to say average because none of us are the same. Okay, so on average. What do we have first? Protein. Most women are going to need about four servings or choices of protein in a day. Okay. Men are going to need five or six. Okay, And that's going to be dependent on how active you are. Like I said, if you're healing from something and you need more resources to repair, if you're active and need you know, your muscles to rebuild, um, if, you have, um, if you have a cut, on your skin and you need to repair that. If um, you need enzymes to support your liver because you're having a problem with your liver or your kidneys, you're going to need a little bit more. Yeah. And that's, ge that's generally where people are falling a little bit short. Um, so when you think about your day, and I like to think about the day because you know, maybe there's a meal where you don't have so much protein, and that's okay. Because it can, the whole, you can look at your whole day and what, what you're having, okay? So, um, women, women at least four, men at least five, if you're a little bit more, more active than probably the six. Um, as far as carbohydrates, um, most women are about eight, and men are about ten. Which isn't a bad deal. You know, we're, that's that's not like in deprivation mode, right? <laughs> and um, fats are going to be um, most women the same thing for for let's see, women are about four, and men are about five. Now that's average. The reality is when we said these two things are energy, right? So when our body takes those at that energy in, our body does different things with it. And some of us are better at taking carbohydrates and turning them into energy. And some of us are better at taking fats and turning them into energy. Okay? So it might be that your because your body does better with one thing than another. Um, and protein is different. So protein is not going to be based on genetically how your body does with those things. Okay. Protein is going to be based on your basic need, which is either three, three for women, you know, more like five for men, or your activity level, or your injury or illness level. The problem is like when we don't feel good, we don't want to eat. Like, oh, I better eat more chicken breast. No. <laughs> I want all the crackers when I don't feel good. I don't know what it is, but um, that's gonna that's gonna be different. Your body's going to have a need based based on what your basic need 
plus anything additional that you might need, okay? Um, and because that is a need, your body needs it, if you don't get that, you're gonna end up with cravings. So people often crave carbohydrates or they crave fats or they crave, you know, whatever it is they crave because they're not getting enough of this at that baseline. Because your body will send you to the pantry, send you to the fridge, send you through the drive-thru, send you to the vending machine, saying we need more protein. But it doesn't tell us that. It just says we need more food. Because I'm not, I don't know, I've not once been like, oh, I'm craving some tilapia. <laughs> Three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm getting tired, I really could use some tilapia. Never, not once. Um, so the message doesn't kind of get sent directly. It says we need more food because we didn't get enough of this. Okay? Um, so by getting enough of this, we're going to better have control in our life over getting the right servings of this. Okay? Like I said, some of us take carbohydrates. We turn it into energy. We feel great when we eat a, a higher carbohydrate diet. Um, we don't do as well with, with the fats. Um, we turn it into energy. We feel good. Others of us don't do as well with the carbohydrates. Like my husband does his body loves dietary fat, okay? Um, I'm good. Can you hear me back there? Um, <laughs> when, when I met Trevor, he had high cholesterol and fatty liver disease. And he was eating a very high carbohydrate diet because he thought that he needed to avoid these things in order to help bring down his cholesterol, his fatty liver disease, all these things, right? Um, and he was a little overweight at the time. <laughs> However, when he has made the shift to having fewer of these, he doesn't not eat fewer of these and more of these in his diet. He is, he's leaner at 42 than he was at 22. He does not have high cholesterol. He doesn't have poor liver enzymes. And for him, he has the most energy and mental focus when he has Even the ones that some people tell us aren't healthy. Like he can have a ribeye with bacon and eggs and cheese on top, and his body feels amazing. If I eat, ate that meal, I would feel like trash. Like I would have zero energy, I would be inflamed, my body would be like, we don't like this. I'd have digestive issues, I couldn't digest that much fat. And for me, my body doesn't like that, but his does. And that's really, to be honest, a diet that a lot of times we feel would be unhealthy, right? Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't, and like I said, so he doesn't eat as much of this, which is a healthy food, um, but it, it works for him. So it made it did he determine that through trial and error, or is that a genetic base? So that is genetically based. Okay. Um, we now we figured out a lot of that based on trial and error over the years, um, and when we started doing, um, and that's part of the reason you know we got into a lot of this this genetic testing because it's like, well, why why does your body do that? Right. And it's based on his genetics. His his body really does well. Because that's an interesting thing that you bring up because the only time I've ever really gone on a diet and lost weight, like just from going on a diet, was the Atkins diet. And I was loading up on bacon, mayonnaise, mm -hmm. hamburgers, cheese, stuff like that. And it, and it did seem unhealthy, but I didn't feel unhealthy, I will say. I, but it seemed like you should not be doing that. Um, and generally speaking, we don't need to completely eliminate food groups. Um, there's always a way to incorporate things, things in your diet. And there's also, you know, within, um, I was trying to keep it a little bit more simple, but within all of these food groups, there's different categories, all right? So like nut butter is a unsaturated, a monounsaturated fat, okay? Where this butter is a saturated fat, okay? So for me, my body likes monounsaturated fats. My body does not like saturated fats. Whereas Trevor's likes it all. <laughs> okay. 
Um, the same thing is true, so for carbohydrates, there are, and this is where the fiber comes in, there's simple carbohydrates and there's complex carbohydrates. So complex carbohydrates are things that have more fiber um, and break down, is this, well this is brown rice, so that's a um, complex carb too. Those are because they're higher in fiber, they're gonna break down more slowly and have less of an impact. If our body doesn't do as well with carbohydrates, we need to make more of these choices, okay? Whereas simple carbohydrates are going to be, um, you know, things like your, you know, your white potatoes, your white pastas, um, whole grain breads or complex carbs, whereas white, usually your white things are the things that are simple carbs. They're going to turn real quick into, um, into sugar. They're not going to have the fiber to kind of help you out. Is it banana? Simple. So, yeah. A banana. I would say probably the only the only white thing cauliflower has a good bit of fiber. That's the only thing I can think of that's white that wouldn't be. Um, they have a tendency to go into. They burn faster. Well, trying to think. Do they go to sugar or do they go to energy? They're always going to go to sugar, mm -hmm. but if you're active, uh -huh. that sugar can be used for okay. energy. Okay? So they all go Yay! to sugar. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it also depends. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it depends on how your body is able, able to use that and where your body stores that. Um, so if you, a lot of people will eat a lot of carbs before they go to exercise. So they have all that energy in there to exercise. And that works for some people. I'll talk about Trevor again. His body doesn't utilize sugar for energy when he exercises. So there's no reason for him to have the banana before he goes to exercise because his body's not gonna use that. Now, there's a reason for him to have some protein because he's gonna be using his muscles and he's gonna benefit from having that extra protein on board to take care of his muscle. But for him, the carbohydrate isn't gonna help him you know, perform better. Um, in fact, it might make him even a little bit more sluggish because um, he's not gonna be able to use that. Whereas other people, like for me, because I'm insulin resistant, my if I have too many carbohydrates, my insulin completely overreacts. However, if I have a carbohydrate after I've exercised, my body doesn't overreact that way. It utilizes that better after I exercise. So where do like the whole artificial sweetener sucralose thing? Because I, I tend to think, this is just my opinion, but I tend to think that they're not as, or they can cause digestive mm -hmm. issues a lot of times, mm -hmm. you know, um, as opposed to just like white sugar or even honey or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So um, the artificial sweeteners are generally zero calories, which means they're not necessarily providing us any energy. Um, they get tricky because you're right, some, some sweeteners cause some people, dig especially so the sugar alcohols, the erythritols, the xylitols, cause some people digestive trouble, okay? Um, the things like, um, uh, the thing like sweet and low, the aspartames, even the sucralose, um, which sucralose is a sweetener that can be, um, something can have sucralose and be labeled natural. It could have sucralose and be labeled no artificial sweeteners because sucralose started as real sugar. So they can say that when we started with this, it was not artificial. However, then we took it to a chemistry lab and turned it into sucralose, but we're gonna still say it was natural. Where we know that like when chemical processes occur, it's not the same thing. Right? The problem with those is for most people, even though they're zero calories, when they consume them, they have the same blood sugar response and insulin response as if they consumed regular sugar. And that's the case for me. I have the same, I'll have pretty much the same response to the sucralose, the aspartame. Um, I can't 
can't even think what some of the others are, but those artificial sweeteners as I would having regular sugar. The problem is, so like the Diet Coke, like you drink the Diet Coke, okay? You're, a lot of us, we're, we're gonna have the same blood sugar and insulin response. We're not gonna be getting the calories, but our, we're still getting the insulin and blood sugar response. Um, and our body gets really confused because it's like, well, we got this insulin and blood sugar response, but we didn't get any energy from that. And we tend to have excessive cravings for sugar and carbohydrates because our body's like, well, we, we actually need some energy here. You gave us what we think is sugar, but there was no energy. So we tend to have a lot of cravings from that, okay? Um, the aspartames, those sort of things, there's a whole other story behind that as far as neurologic problems that are associated with that. Um, the sucralose really is safer in terms of health. However, we still have the blood sugar insulin response. Okay, cause inflammation. Yes, yeah. Um, because high insulin causes inflammation. So it's a this happens and this happens and this happens. So anytime we have high blood sugars and a high insulin response, our, in, our body's going to increase in inflammation. Why does that matter if we're interested in weight loss? Because insulin is a fat storage hormone. So anytime your insulin goes up, your body is not capable of releasing any fat from your stores for energy. Because that, that's, that's why we store body fat, to save it for later. So we, you know, the Cheetos that we ate five years ago that have been, you know, sitting on us, they're just waiting to be used for energy. But if our insulin is up, um, we can never open, it like locks down our fat cells so it can't be used for energy. Whereas if we're able to keep our insulin low, if we run out of energy, we can then open up the fat cells and take some that we had stored previously. Um, I want to be cognizant of your time because I've, I've talked for nearly an hour. Um, so, so my main message here is think about your day, okay? Um, and I even encourage people, you don't need to track every bite of food you put in every day of your life. But I encourage people every once in a while to take a couple days and write down what they're actually eating and then think about, well, at the end of the day, let's do a little math, how many servings or portions of carbs did we get? How many of these did we get? Like I said, most people, especially women, um, just traditionally we tend to eat more salads and things. And I don't know if that's a, a mental, psychological thing, but we don't eat enough protein. Um, and a lot of us, some, if we've been on the you know, fat-free mentality, sometimes we're not getting enough healthy fats. Sometimes we're overdoing those and having way too many of those. And finding that, um, Hi. Hello. Finding that balance, um, um, just first of all, keeping track and seeing where you are. This is where I am. And then seeing maybe where you need to dial things up and where you need to dial things down. Okay. Um, the fitness and nutrition genetic testing helps us very much because we can tell you exactly, well, women are between like maybe four and six of here, or maybe between eight and 12, or um, we can then tell you exactly this is what your body needs. Okay. And the reason I don't like to look at it per meal is because when we eat these foods affects our body too. So for example, for me, I need to have healthy fat at breakfast because I also have ADD. And in order for me to be able to have good attention, I need to feed my brain some healthy fats in the morning, okay? Carbohydrates, because my, um, of my genetically based, the way my circadian rhythm is, I don't produce as much melatonin at night to be able to sleep. So I eat my carbohydrates in the evening because carbohydrates help my body produce more melatonin. If I, if I eat carbohydrates at breakfast, I'm gonna produce a bunch of melatonin. We, are we all familiar with melatonin? Mm -hmm. People take it as a supplement. So uh, if, if I, my body produces a bunch of melatonin at eight o'clock in the morning, that's not gonna do me any good, <laughs> right? I want, I want my melatonin to come at like six o'clock, seven o'clock in the evening as my body can start making that and help me sleep well. 
So those are just some things you can dial in even deeper when you know a little bit more about yourself. If you know if you're insulin resistant, um, if you have um, things, you know, health issues in your life that creep up, you can make changes that way too. If you do see your cholesterol start to creep up, um, or if you see your blood sugar, you know, you go to the doctor and your blood sugar's creeping up, um, you know that maybe we need to maybe increase the fiber and decrease the amount of sugar that we're we're pulling in. Um, so again, just finding, kind of seeing where we are, because sometimes where we are in reality is not where we are. Like I said, for me, every time I'm low on protein, I just don't, I just don't love meat. I'm not a vegetarian, I just don't love it. So I'll have um, a little bit, like for me, um, a protein shake is the only way I'm gonna meet my protein requirements in a day. Nearly always is the only way that I'm gonna meet that mark. Um, again, I consider, so people ask about shakes and bars and stuff for, you know, to get more protein or fats or carbs. Um, I consider those supplements. Um, it's not real food. It's made from real food, but it's not real food. Um, and that's the point of supplements. Supplements are supposed to fill in the gaps where we can't in nutrition, okay, in micronutrients. For example, Trevor, because he doesn't eat as much of this and eats more of that, he's not getting the micronutrients from all this colorful stuff. So there are things that he supplements with to boost that because he's not getting enough from his diet. Is there, um, because I, I'm a big supplement person because I have no idea what, what the balance is, and I'm sure I'm not alone, but when you go through some of the genetic testing and stuff, does that play into it? Or like, should I continue to take my Sundrum and my vitamin D and my Juice Plus stuff and all that, Mm -hmm. I take it just because I just don't Did you feel know. like it's the right thing to do? Yeah. 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 I just yeah. Don't the reality is it's different. So supplements are supposed to fill in the gaps. Real, f you cannot supplement your way out of eating healthy food. Like that has to be your basis, okay? I like to think of supplements as my jewelry. So my clothes are my food, right? And you, you know, you get dressed, you look in the mirror and you're like, something's missing. Like, oh, maybe something <laughs> or, you know, maybe I need, you know, um, you know, maybe what's missing, and that's kind of the jewelry that you put on to help you feel a little bit better, feel a little bit more confident. Maybe men don't kind of get this analogy. <laughs> but, you, you understand this, you would not walk out of your house with just your jewelry on and not your clothes, right? So the clothes go on first, and then we say, where are the gaps? What am I not getting because genetically I need more? So some of us genetically need more than other things. Trevor needs more B6. No, yes. No, yes, he needs more B6 I get to look my than I do. Um, I don't need more B6. I need more B12, okay? So for, you know, we're gonna supplement different things. Um, uh, omega-3 fatty acids. A lot of us are deficient in omega-3 fatty acids. If you eat a ton of fish, you're probably gonna get enough. If you, just because of your lifestyle, you're not gonna get enough fish. So our kids supplement with omega-3 because they need more based on their genetics and they're not going to eat fish. One of them ever. <laughs> the other one maybe once a week. But we know that to get enough omega-3s, they need to be eating fish at least three or four times a week. That's not gonna happen, so we supplement. Omega-3s are very related to inflammation. So anyone that has a high level of inflammation, I recommend that as a supplement. Anyone who, so for me, genetically, I have a high risk for inflammation, so that's something that I supplement with. So again, it is very individualized. Um, we have, so there's an online health assessment you can take um, through the company that we do the genetic testing with, but you can do the health assessment without doing the genetic testing, and it's gonna take into consideration your lifestyle, the things that you're eating, um, medical history, medications that you take, because the reality is some medications um, co are contradict or contraindicated to take with certain supplements. Um, it's gonna ask lifestyle things. It's HIPAA privacy compliant, so you can be completely honest. Don't lie. <laughs> um, nobody's gonna know, uh, except, you know, this inter, you know, whatever happens on the internet as far as the <laughs> algorithm. Um, but it's going to help you know kind of what's safe and what could be effective. If you have your DNA information, 
you can add that and kind of get even more specific to you. But if not, it still can give you a general guideline of these are the things your body needs. And if it's not on the on your on the list of these are these are things that would be good for you to take, then you shouldn't be taking it. Okay. Just for one example, um, people who smoke or people who are exposed to secondhand smoke should not take beta carotene as a supplement. Um, it increases someone who smokes or is exposed to secondhand smoke. It increases the risk of lung cancer by 20%. Okay? Beta carotene is an antioxidant. So it would be assumed that you know if you're in that situation, you should boost up your antioxidants and make you healthier, right? Well, in actuality, it's doing the opposite. I mean, millions of little things like that that I couldn't possibly, you know, I, I can help you out, but I can't have all that stuff in my brain. There's too many other things up there. Um, so having a system to be able to tell you, uh, for example, I have a ragweed allergy, and because I have a ragweed allergy, there's cer certain supplements I shouldn't take because they're going to cause me to have a histamine response like my ragweed allergy. And that's not something I ever knew. But allergists never told me that. <laughs> didn't even consider it. So um, I'm happy, um, you know, if anybody needs to go, please, please do so, because I know that we've been here over an hour, but I'm happy to, you know, chat about anything nutrition-wise. Um.